Welcome, my name is Eric Fabian. Today I am speaking with one of my favorite YouTube video makers, uh, Sean Woods. He is someone who, hey Sean, welcome. Hey. Uh, he is somebody who has a, a very popular channel uh, exploring topics of bushcraft, archery, foraging. Um, I invited him to be part of a, a series looking into these kind of videos. People are going out into nature, making videos out in the boonies somewhere and uh and really kind of thinking about history and how we how we engage with nature and also how do we make videos how do we make content in that kind of place so hopefully uh we can kind of unpack some of the ideas behind his work and uh, maybe pull out some tips for people who are uh you know maybe starting a new channel so sean uh tell us a little bit about your channels like uh how, how do you think of it nowadays I started with on my YouTube channel about four years ago, and it's something I just did for fun. I was doing all these projects out in nature and thought I might as well video them and uh, load them to YouTube. And I've been amazed at just uh, the response I've gotten. And uh, really the filming it and sharing it has become a big part of the, the experience of learning these new skills. And uh, I learn a lot from the people who watch the videos and give me input. So it's really interactive. I have uh, minimal experience in making videos. It's all self-taught, and I have uh, very simple equipment, too. So uh, I'm just an amateur that's having fun and uh, really surprised at just how well the videos have done on YouTube. And they have done well. I, I think, you know, I looked at your numbers recently. You have over 12,000 subscribers. You have uh, over a couple million um, views overall of all your videos. And I know you, you've had uh, several over 100,000 uh, several videos with over 100,000 views and, and you, the one about um, primitive hunting uh, with archery it, through archery I think it's like a 600,000 view video yeah. so you've had some that have really broken out and uh, and I think when I originally found you I was uh, searching around for videos about archery uh, mm -hmm. and kind of discovered some of your work and um, and I guess uh, well how, how did you get started like what when you you know kind of you know a few years ago when you were just getting together you know what what made you want to start to make videos? Um, I was always interested in the outdoor skills and kind of when I started going on YouTube for the first time and seeing the content out there, it was just such a useful resource that I thought I could maybe contribute and share some of the knowledge and experience I had too. So yeah, it's just a curiosity to learn and to share. And you, grew up, you grew up like on a farm, right? Yep. So My parents have a farm with uh, cattle in Western Oregon. So you were always out there kind of working with animals and kind of outdoors, that kind of thing. So it's yep. just kind of an extension of that growing up. Yep. And did you, um, did you, is archery hunting, is this the kind of stuff that you did as a child? And were you always like hunting with primitive bows and things you would make yourself? I uh, always was interested in nature and hunting. Uh, my dad always took me hunting uh, over in Eastern Oregon for deer with a rifle. So I grew up as a rifle hunter and we were pretty successful at it. Um, and then when I got to college, my college roommates were into archery. So I uh, wanted to go with them and I didn't have the money for the experience expensive compound bows they had but my dad had an old uh, bear recurve 1960s so I uh, didn't have any money to spend on new stuff so I used his old stuff and just fell in love with uh, shooting that bow and the traditional side of it and next year I saved up enough money and got a fiberglass recurve bow and hunted with that and was successful killed several uh, deer and uh, antelope and elk with that and then over the time, I just learned how to make my own equipment, my own arrows, bows, and then just progressed from there to getting into the primitive side of it. And, and how, and just thinking about like the experience of being out there with a, a primitive bow, when maybe one you made yourself, or um, uh, at least a simpler kind of recurve kind of bow, how's that experience different than working with like a compound bow or a gun for you? Um, you have to get a lot closer. Uh, the the comfort zone of an animal where their natural predators are trying to kill them, like a cougar or something like that, is pretty close. So when you're out there with a gun at 300 yards and you're able to shoot them, well, they don't even know they're there. It's You can be very successful and it can be rewarding, but I really enjoyed uh, trying to get into that really close zone where they're used to predators chasing their whole lives and uh, the primitive archery more so than the the compound archery because there's no sights there's no aids at all you just have to get close i like to get less than 20 or 15 yards or even closer uh, to make a shot so 
it's a whole different experience that um, most hunters, I don't think, get to experience having to get that close to the animal. Right, totally. Do you, um, and do you feel like uh, now you've been videotaping some of these experiences and I mean, that must make it much harder to kind of get close and to actually do things like this. I think it's the hardest hunting you can do is hunting with primitive homemade equipment and try to film yourself. Uh, I haven't really had anybody out there as a cameraman. So I'm sitting there finding an animal, sneaking close, setting up my gear, turning it on, then trying to make the shot. And that is just so difficult. Uh, animals are really in tune, especially to electronic uh, sound. So I've, I've been close enough for a shot, turn on the camera and they just run because they heard a little beep of the camera. So it's, it's a million times harder to film yourself than to even just hunt with primitive gear. Yeah, but, and, and I guess you've also been lately, um, it, it, making some videos about kind of on topics of foraging like kind of like different plants and so on that um uh, have a historic kind of uh, relationship with your uh kind of ecosystem and and uh it, it been exploring like how you gather them and also how you use them um what's your wh what's your mindset around that what what, what drew, drew you to it um, I just love learning all about the different plants and animals that live in the ecosystem and hunting. You learn more about animals hunting than, uh, if you didn't hunt because you're being a predator, there's a different relationship and plants is kind of a similar way where, uh, when you're looking at them as food, uh, just native peoples were so in tune with their environment cause they had to, to survive, know when certain plants are, uh, ready to be harvested. And, and I've just found that, uh, especially this year, I've been trying to learn every edible plant and uh, harvest it and so you can miss uh if you're not paying attention you can miss in a matter of a week uh collecting things like cattail pollen i did and that that was good for about a week and a half and then it's all that resource is gone so there's there's so many plants over 60 plants i'm keeping an eye on and seeing how they're progressing and when they're going to be ready to harvest and that is just really different than even a botanist who learns about it but when you're when you're trying to collect it as a resource, it's a, it's a unique relationship with nature. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I've been, um, uh, playing around with foraging for a couple of years and that's one of the things I, I found that nobody mentions right off the bat is like, you know, you're hoping to develop this kind of literacy and be able to kind of ID plants and figure out what to do with them. But it, it seems like there's a lot of times where you need to watch a plant go through its whole life cycle over a year to kind of know it's, kind of different ways that you can kind of uh, it can appear and then also yeah. to kind of catch those windows when it's actually useful and then yeah. um and i also hear a lot of people talk about when you actually want to kind of understand people might have used these plants for food as their primary food source that you can't just count on things being available right when you need them you have to have like this whole whole year kind of perspective that includes storage mm -hmm. and includes all these things because you got to cat get it when you when you can yeah um what about uh and i know history is a big part of kind of what your work and what you think about is that do you do you look to history for inspiration or, or how does how does your kind of uh, passion for the past kind of fit into all this yeah i love just seeing how people lived in the past and that goes all the way back to as old as they're finding artifacts in uh certain different tier time periods or artifacts catch my uh, kind of interest and then I try to learn as much as I can about them. So I did that with the, the Iceman just because it wasn't just a few artifacts. It was kind of, you could learn a lot about his life and how he lived back then just from all the different artifacts that were with him. Uh, Ishii's always been really interesting to me because he was one of the last Stone Age people in North America. So he's kind of the end of that era. So, I mean, from 6,000 years to early 1900s, uh, it's a big time frame of, of interest that I have in looking at historical artifacts and trying to replicate them. So uh, you typically, your process kind of starts with research and you start with a topic that you're interested in? Yeah, or a skill that I want to learn. And then I go back and look at the, the history and the artifacts that have been dug up. Like, for example, I'm interested this year in learning about uh, primitive fishing techniques and fish hooks. And all over the world, there's many different styles of fish hooks. It's been real fun looking at the different cultures and how they all basically made the same fish hook design, but uh, in different ways they did it with different resources. And, so. and you're based in Oregon, right? Um, yep. So do you do you think particularly about your the, the, the kind of uh, the history of the local communities that have lived there in that landscape, or do you do you compare this to kind of more global kind of communities and, and those things? Do you, how do you, how does that inform what you do? 
Yeah, I like learning about the the local uh, Native American culture here because they were relying on these resources, so they survived and thrived in this area. So they had a lot of knowledge about uh, what resources are useful. They there are so many resources that they actually didn't really develop or domesticate uh, crops because they could rely on the wild food supplies. So learning those has really helped. But I'm also interested in you know I'm of European descent and they have a Stone Age too. So uh, kind of you little everybody has a you know stone age past and if you go back far enough and so i like learning about all different around the world more globally just to tie it directly to my kind of ancestry and do you um uh and, and today and thinking about resources just in terms of community in terms of other people who i'm sure you meet through creating youtube videos or maybe you were around in your kind of region when you were uh, learning new skills and looking for information like what kind of resources do you tap into in your region to kind of learn and to, to do things today? Uh, there's such a wealth of information here in Western Oregon. They're one of the best bow makers for U bows lives close to me named John Strunk. And so I've taken classes with him and learned and best flint nappers are over here too. Steve Alley lives in Sisters not far and is over at some of the events they do the glass butte nap. And so there's a lot of people out there doing different skills that uh, you can just connect with and learn from. And some of the people on YouTube I've connected with in Western Oregon, uh, like guy named Got Rocks and Head is a real interesting uh, YouTube channel just because he is basically a you know, life blog of him going out in the woods and doing all kinds of fun, crazy stuff. And uh, seeing how much fun he was having making videos kind of got me interested in it too. Really? Sharon. Yeah. Do you get a lot of inspiration from looking at other YouTube videos? Do you look at a lot of other YouTube makers? Um, I wish I had more time. Uh, I I do have my list of favorites that I like to see what uh, they're doing and keep track on. And it's funny. Just last week, one of uh, one of the most entertaining ones I think is a guy named Primitive Tim who's been doing a road trip. And uh, I saw he was like in uh, North Dakota or something, and a little map showed that he was coming into Oregon. So I emailed him, "Hey, if you're in here, maybe we could connect." And he was actually had been delayed in posting, so he was already in Oregon. That so he came over for dinner just a few hours later but yeah there's there's a lot of different youtube channels that are really good that i'd like to to watch and interact with leave so, comments or, so did one of you like capture that dinner and like share it with your fans <laughs> uh, we didn't we just we just enjoyed a dinner but it was pretty funny because he's been living in a van driving across the country and he showed up and i think he was expecting something different he came to my house and there's it's, it's, not, not, it's a, not a hut it's, it's not a hut it's yeah. there's not you know bows and arrows everywhere so it's it was it's it was pretty funny to see he's like this is where you live but i i do have a man cave in the basement but uh, with all the primitive projects but there. yeah it's fun actually seeing them on youtube is one thing you feel like you get to know them, but then actually meeting them face to face is really fun kind of learning and sharing stories right and um and you use uh a, a very kind of like documentary style to what you do. It, it kind of, um, kind of articulates, uh, a lot of the background history and like kind of walks through the process quite often. And, um, I know that you also, you work as a wildlife biologist, if, if, if I'm correct. And, um, yeah. do you kind of, as somebody who's trained as kind of a scientist, like how does that impact the way that you think about, you know, going about the work that you, you do and then also sharing it? Like, um, yeah, uh, I try to learn as much as I can about a subject when I film. I film so much and then I get to editing the video. And on YouTube, I, I found that people lose interest quickly after about 10 minutes especially, but after five minutes. So uh, when I make videos, I have so much footage and I try to bring every second down to the bare minimum of giving as much good information as possible, um, as clear as possible, and as concise as possible so that they're not sitting uh, just kind of bored waiting for the good stuff. And yet I also find that you, you cite your sources quite a bit and you, you're often trying to offer a path for people to figure out what uh, you know, find more information. You know, how do you think about that in, in terms of kind of educating people? Yeah, 
when you post videos, people always are uh, either you know excited and leave good comments, or there's a lot of people out there that uh, don't agree with what you put and uh, and uh, let you know that you're not doing it right or didn't do it right. So I like to leave sources so that they can go back and look and see. I try to be as close as possible uh, to the originals, and uh, it just helps to let other people hopefully you spark an interest, and then they can maybe start their own YouTube channel if they're interested and explore subjects further. So some subjects I just you know, skim the surface and others that go a little deeper, but there's always room for someone else to improve on what I've done. And what kind of, a, what's your equipment set up like? Um, it is the most basic. So I started out with uh, just this simple Olympus camera that's kind of weather resistant. I don't even have a video camera and uh, I got that for Christmas and then later I got this uh, Nikon D3200 but those are my cameras, uh, really basic and then I got a laptop with uh, iMovie on it and so yeah it's, uh, it's bare bones minimum so equipment. You go, so you go out with the tripod and then you just capture the sound through the, the cameras that you have? And yeah, as as much as possible, and I, I because it's not as good a quality. A lot of times, I have to go back and talk over and edit it. Uh, so, a lot of it. so and it, so it seems to me that you know your style to some degree is kind of, it was a way of dealing with the cameras that you're working with. So you um, because you can't capture the audio maybe always in an ideal circumstance, and that you're pulling together a lot of material from um, different sources and editing it after doing a lot of editing. Um, in some ways, that that kind of helped. It helped you find your style. If, if yeah, it, yeah, that's uh, the equipment that really influenced how I make my videos. So. Do, do you uh, and do you think about it, the, like the look and feel of your videos? Like in the, is that a big concern to you, or, or are you focus mostly on just clarity of communication? Or um... yeah, it, I'm an amateur, so I I'm not you know, trying to put out the most professional product, but I try to do the best I can with equipment and time I have. So uh, sometimes I'll go back to the early videos and there'll be things I would have changed and it'll be like, oh man, but um, this this learning and changing over time too. But sometimes you'll do a quick video just in your backyard of something simple and it will be really popular that you didn't expect. So you can't always predict what's going to be a great video and what's not. Sometimes the really edited stuff with a lot of time doesn't get very many views and some of the silly stuff you just go back. I'm going to make an arrowhead a day does really well. So it's, it's fun. Right. Right. What kind of challenges do you face like with, with your video making? Like, do you, um, I know you have a family time must be, must be an issue. Like how, how, what, how what's, what do you have to overcome to do what you do? Yeah, uh, time is probably the biggest thing for being more prolific, but this is something I do for fun, so I'm not out there to put as many videos as possible, and I'll work on projects for a year getting all the material and everything wow. uh, before I put it on sometimes. So, uh, yeah, I'm a dad and a husband first, and so this is just a fun little project I do when I do have some spare time, which uh, isn't always much. Like, my boys just woke up from their nap, so my wife's watching them, but it's it's a lot of, uh, I do a lot of stuff with the, the boys on my lap, too, so my little one-year-old's been practicing friction fires because that's what I do. So he grabs a stick, and that's what he does. And my three-year-old bangs rocks together, says he's making arrowheads all the time. It's it's pretty fun. Right. Do you um, uh, and do you feel like the uh, would you have a lot of content like waiting to be edited or like? Yeah. So I have a, I have about fifty videos on YouTube, and I probably have over a hundred that are started or you know 80 percent done the films done so uh i have way more ideas than i have time to put the videos up and uh, i have a huge massive hard drive just full of projects that are about ready to be <laughs> loaded so there's, a, there's a treasure trove waiting yeah. to be un unearthed sometime in the future yeah i uh, actually just lost it the, the hard drive was broke and so i took it in just you know, devastated, but they're able to recover everything. So I was like, I, it's good to have a double backup because I was pretty nervous for a while there having a, a terabyte of equipment that was, uh, you yeah. know, in jeopardy. <laughs> you got to think about the you of like a hundred years from now when they're like looking back and trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, they, they need your resources. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do, uh, and then is there anything particular? I mean, you, you, you you live in Oregon, you know, you, you, you're in that kind of uh, ecosystem. Is there any uh, particular challenges to kind of shooting in, in the kind of environments that you live in as far as weather or for, uh, in, ter in terms of like access to resources or, or different kinds of variations on your ecosystem? 
Yeah. Oregon's really diverse. If you've never been there, we got the coast just a little over an hour away from where I live, all the way up to the mountains and the desert in the east. So uh, just my state has many different ecosystems to learn. And challenges are, you know, it rains a lot. So I use my uh, weather resistant camera a lot of times when it's raining. I've done hunting uh, videos in the winter when it's gotten too cold and my camera's batteries don't work too hot that the cameras overheat so there's a lot of different challenges with the weather uh, when filming and if you encounter a topic that you just can't crack like you can't find some information that you're looking for or something like how do you think about that like how do you would 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 you do um so probably the best example is one i have right here and uh this is a mold made out of lead of the Let's see the Iceman axe. So mm -hmm. I've learned how he's, uh, they think he's made them. They poured them in a mold and poured it from the top. And um, copper is a hard one to get to a melting point. So I started with something more simple just to learn the basic things. So pouring lead is easy. And I got the mold down. But finding how they got copper ore and made that into melted copper back then is just so hard. So I've been working. I'm trying to do uh, melt it with oxyacetylene and get it at least to a molten state where I can make one. But if I can't figure out how they do it, I'll use more modern means and try to at least get the end results and then work my way back from there. So still working on that one. <laughs> sometimes going from the front forward, sometimes kind of thinking backwards and coming from the back of an idea. Interesting. Yep. Uh, well, well, why don't we walk through one of your videos and the kind of like how you went about making it and, you know, just kind of get into some of the details. You just posted one on cattails, cat, foraging for cattails, very popular um, kind of uh, uh plant for people who like to kind of forage for food it's got a lot of uses and um and you also talked about pickling it and uh so maybe how did how did you start like how did that end up on your list of uh plants to go after and and then maybe you could take us through how you got to the final video Okay. One of the things I've uh, talked about doing earlier this year is I came up with a bushcraft bucket list. I love to, since I have so many ideas in my head, I kind of organize them with like challenges and lists. And um, those were 10 skills I wanted to learn. And one of them was to learn all the wild foods I could and uh, collect that and live on that for a time period of just wild foods. So I've been doing a lot of food collecting, harvesting, preparation, uh, preserving. So and when eat, I, And you're eating as you go, but then you're also going to carve out a time in the future yeah. and just kind of eat on the, what you've stored yeah. that kind of thing. Okay. January, January of next year. So I'm, I'm okay. tasting as I go, but, uh, I'm saving as much as I can for the future. So cat cattails were coming into season. So I did a cattail video cause that's what, uh, that particular time I was working on. So, yeah. And then, so, uh, some people call, I think cattails like the supermarket of the, of the, of the water kind of something like that and like because you can go after the roots you can go after the you know the the pollen you can go off after the stalks um so you probably had to go after out to the plant multiple times over the period of its kind of growth Yep. So the, the pickles were actually, I harvested them earlier than the other videos I've done, but I wanted to let them sit in a jar and pickle for a couple of weeks. So I delayed posting that, but it's best to get those little shoots when they're younger and you can just grab those top leaves and give a yank and get that tender heart inside. And uh, when they were ready, I uh, collected enough for a batch of pickles and uh, made them. I've made pickles for years with cucumbers in my garden. So it's pretty easy to just do them with, uh, with the cattails, but yeah, they were in season for a short window. So uh, that's when I canned them. And when do you, uh, uh, kind of like start to finish how, how long did it take you to make that particular video? Um, so filming, I think I had about, you know, 40 minutes of raw footage on that and editing that down. Uh, I probably have, for four hours or so in the editing and voiceover and getting all the pictures and uh posting it so it's like five uh, hours actual kind of work and then and you started were you able to do this like in a week or or did you take a couple months or how did you work? yeah it was about over a month uh, that I was collecting footage of different locations. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of footage that doesn't make it to the final cut. So I, I just film every time I'm around them and harvest them in different stages and uh, then really narrow down to the best footage for the video. Do you write a script or, or, or you know, what you want to say um, before you start to record or you just kind of speak off the top of your head? Um, I, I have a script in my head, so uh, it's really thought out, and uh, it's not just you know 
whatever comes to mind, but I don't write it down either. So I basically have the idea in my head when I'm filming, and then as I'm going back into editing down, I'm just finalizing those thoughts in, in the words as I'm going. So a lot of times I'll do a voice over it and didn't like what I say and just change right then. And uh, so a lot of times every little voiceover thing I do for the footage, I'll do maybe four or five or more times just to see what sounds the best and uh, what flows. Right. Um, do you, uh, I will also, I, sh we should mention that you, I think mixed in some scorpion peppers or something from your garden. Uh, like you, you're <laughs> kind of like, uh, you, you like really hot foods and I think you've, you've been eating, growing them in your backyard or something. What's, yeah. what's the story there? Um, I didn't have any interest in hot peppers until, uh, a guy on YouTube started growing them, uh, named his, he's a crazy guy named Pestle Man. He's a really entertaining channel, but he started he had a friend that gave him the hottest like five varieties of peppers in the world and he did a challenge where he grew them and would mail them to whoever wanted to try them and he mailed me too so I ate one on video just as a challenge and then uh, saved the seeds and grew grew them the uh, next year and I've been keeping those going so I have a hot pepper forest in my backyard every year and it's even bigger this year so I got a lot more of the the reapers the number one hottest but I have all these peppers and don't really know what to do with them. So I'm trying to learn different ways to actually use them where you're not uh, too hot. So one pepper per pickle jar was, was a good amount. I mean, it's, it's really hot, but it's, it's a good way to use them. Have you looked at any of the historical like uses or anything of these hot peppers in your research yet? Um, yeah, so the hot peppers are, there's uh, always developing new varieties and even in the same varieties, new lines that are hotter. So that's more of a recent phenomenon, I think, with trying to get that Guinness Book of World Records. So I went back and got some of the, uh, the wild peppers, uh, so the, the original uh, varieties that weren't even cultivated, and I'm growing those too. So the little ones that are about the size of a, a pea, so that plant's doing really well. So I have the wild varieties and then the hottest varieties in the world. So maybe they'll cross pollinate and I'll be getting some interesting <laughs> some new ones. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever uh, like? Do you have friends that are into these things? Do you guys? Do you have people over and eat cattails together or anything? Um, occasionally I get together, especially with the archery stuff, um, making bows and arrows. That's a real interest. So, uh, a lot of people will see my videos and want to try things, but, uh, a lot, most of what I do is solo. I'm out there alone doing it. So I, I'll go to some events and, and, uh, hang out with people of similar interests, but mostly just by myself. <laughs> and do you, um, well, let's talk about like, you know, somebody who is, you know, just getting started they're they're in the archery or they're in the one of these topics and you know they're going out with maybe very simple equipment like you are and uh you know what have you learned uh as you've kind of uh been making these videos uh about how to be efficient and to make things that look good and uh you know that makes your process kind of go work well yeah uh, you got to learn your equipment i don't know how many times i've done things uh where i went 20 minutes make an arrowhead and then learned that my camera's batteries were dead or wasn't turned on or so even if you have simple equipment learning uh how it works i especially have learned that when i've gone out hunting with uh friends and i'm like here for homie sneaking up on this deer and it's actually never turned out where they actually have good footage. So you just get an eye for keeping things in focus, uh, what it's going to look like on the camera. It's it's kind of a foreign skill that if you're not doing it and 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 uh, making videos, it's it's hard for people. So even people that are photographers or uh, have a different mindset getting a good picture than getting good video, good audio, the lighting, uh, that kind of thing. So learning your equipment's big and uh, just finding a good location where you can maybe if you're in nature that always helps and uh yeah do you feel like um that you know when people are looking for content like what are they going to shoot like a lot of people i feel like in the youtube universe especially when they're getting started will you know see somebody who you know has a friction fire making video or something and they'll try it themselves and then they'll kind of share that and like when people are looking for content, especially when they're getting going, like how, you know, how, what would you offer as far as kind of helping them kind of identify the things that, um, you know, might be fun to, for them to do, but also might be fun for somebody else to watch? Yeah. Um, 
sometimes those amateur ones where people are doing the first time are the most uh, useful because they show what not to do or different challenges in getting started and they're not polished. So if you're interested in a different skill or learn as much as you can, see different styles and diff how people do it and go try it yourself to see what works. You and I, we've talk talked about failure and how important that is and, and fun to watch. Like, how do you think, how do you think about, you know, failure, showing the failures, you know, in the, in the, in the work that you make? Yeah, it's important to show uh, not being successful just as much as successful. So like one of my second most popular videos is me not shooting a deer that I almost did. And, uh, you know, I, I almost didn't put that up just because I was like, I didn't kill it. People aren't going to want to see that. But uh, it's still very popular just to show how difficult it is. Uh, I would I would have way more kills uh if i wasn't filming it but that just that process of including people in the actual experience really uh makes it more rewarding for me and it's kind of fun to sit in a, a tree and know that there's there could be a million people that are sharing this experience with you by the time you're done so even even if uh you do fail uh it's still fun to share that with people and, and i guess let's let's talk about the people who watch your videos and um like who who do you think is your audience like who 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 do you connect with uh it's interesting i was looking at the stats and over over half of them aren't even in the united states so it's you got to stop thinking about making videos like this uh in just your local area but really it's worldwide and uh even though it's in a different language people still look at it so a lot of times when i'm making videos i try to be as visual as possible because there's a lot of people out there that don't even speak your language that are still interested in watching what you're doing and I get that a lot. Uh, there's a Google Translate so people can leave a message in their language and you can translate it and they, they get a lot out of it even though they don't understand what you're saying. So um, that was a, the most eye-opener to me is that it's really uh, YouTube's a worldwide uh, experience. It's not just your local area or even your country or somebody that speaks your own language. Um, and then the other half are, I get everything from, uh, I get a lot of comments from young girls that are interested in the Hunger Games and want to learn how to shoot a bow and arrow and your video pops up. So uh, to people who have been doing it for a long time, to people who have hunted and are interested in archery. Or, so it's really diverse. And uh, even... I've had people that are, go, they go on YouTube because they don't uh, like hunting videos. So they go there to say bad comments. And I've had people say, like, I don't agree with anything you're doing with killing animals, but it's interesting the process you're doing. So right. yeah, it's a, it's, you never know what you're going to expect when you see that comment. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's interesting. And I think, you know, I really get a lot of pleasure watching people from different parts of the world. And I think that that sense of difference and being able to access a place you can't otherwise access um, you know, I, whether they're in Britain or they're in a jungle somewhere in Southeast Asia is, is always int intriguing. And, and I find mm -hmm. that, um, definitely, uh, trying to find a unique spot for yourself and showing things that are different always, uh, seems to work pretty well. The, um, do you, do you, sp are you able to like, um, respond to a lot of the comments you get at this point or like, how do you interact with your, the people that you, um, that leave you comments or are fans of your videos? Yeah, I, I wish I had more time to, to uh, answer comments. Early on when I didn't have that many views, I was excited to get comments and I'd leave an answer on everybody that, that commented. But uh, it's not uncommon to get 40 or more emails a day of different comments. So I just don't have time to respond to everybody. And uh, so sometimes one, one will stick out and I'll, I'll comment on that or try to share or help someone. But a lot of times I... I won't comment on it and then four or five other people will comment on it. So they use the comment section as kind of a, you know, a chat room where they're all interacting with each other apart from me. So I don't always have to comment on everyone's question for them to get the answer. So uh, that's a big part of it. And then I get a lot of uh, being a hunting related, I get a lot of hate hate comments. So I have to ban a lot of people from my channel. So I, people are like, Oh, there's only good comments on there. Cause I remove any, you know, foul language or nasty. I'll put, if someone disagrees, I'll leave it up there. But if they're just nasty, I'll take it off. So that, that's another thing I wasn't fully ready to expect was, you know, I'd say 95% of the stuff's good, but some of the, the other 5% can be pretty, pretty nasty because people can be anonymous and just, uh, you know, right. so just troll. That, <laughs> so that moderating function is that there's some work there and you have to kind of, deal with it and like did you 
I guess from when you started and maybe you made your first few videos, which maybe you know you a few people saw until when you started to get some more popular videos, I imagine that that work and that kind of like level of kind of engagement, there was a point when you just couldn't manage it anymore or like how did that transition happen for you? Yeah, I just couldn't manage it anymore. And uh, a lot of people are really interested in it and they, they see it on a video on YouTube and feel like they're personally connected to you. So they email you wanting you to send them a, a arrow so they can shoot it or make them a bow. Or uh, I get a lot of requests for that kind of thing. And I, I wish I could do that and I'd love to share, but I just don't have time. So a lot of times I'm almost nervous to engage people because it usually ends up wanting to be more than I have time for. And right. it's, uh, yeah, but I have, I have done that before. I've the only bow I've ever made that I don't still have is over in Ireland because a really great YouTube fan and really wanted one so uh, I didn't I didn't want him selling one for money I just made one and sent it over but yeah it's it's fun to see the comments but it can be a two-edged sword you just can't manage all of them because it'll be too time-consuming right absolutely do you uh, so how it so you've been doing this for a few years and like you know you've been making these videos on all these different to topics to help you kind of go through your list of, um, of interests has it changed the way that you engage with nature and you uh, engage with history and you engage with the hunting um, by making these videos and being a part of the community that you're part of yeah I especially with the foraging uh, wanting to do videos on it I, I really been focused on trying to collect everything so I always have my camera with me and I've learned that some of those are opportunities are so rare that you, when you when it's there you've got to stop and pull over the car if you see a plant or something and, and film it and uh, so just thinking also about you know as you're out there by yourself uh, what would be interesting for other people and uh, what would they like to see out here so just collecting the footage is uh, the biggest thing do you uh do you think about your kids and like, you know, what you do and like them either being able to see what you've made, you know, as they get older or, you know, at some point being able to, uh, you know, help them make videos like this or something like that? Yeah, it's interesting to think like what if your grandparents or great grandparents or uh, even farther back you could never knew that you would be able to document and store everything. It's going to be interesting in the future how you know future generations can look back and do family research and actually feel like they can get to know you even though you're you're long gone so it's it's it is a legacy thing that i never really thought about until recently but it's just out there as uh, a resource for the kids and they are they like being a part of the project so like eating those cattail pickles they wanted to try them or the cattail corn on the cob so i gave it to them and thought oh, i'll include them in that video i haven't done that too much but they do they do like to be part of it right do you uh um, and i guess what's next for your channel like i, I know you have your list like wh where are you going to be going for the next year or so um a million different directions but more uh, at first, it was so focused on archery, and I really enjoyed that. But as you learn more about those primitive skills, uh, I expanded to basically all survival and bushcraft skills that were, uh, you know, away from the more modern technology and studying how people lived and thrived in the past. Hunting and archery is, is a really important part, but it's a small part of it. So more more expanded to the bushcraft and survival skills of different aspects. Uh, I'm trying to get everything on my list done. So I was uh, sewing some moccasins yesterday, learning different styles of that, uh, chipping stone bowls and, you know, cooking. I've been really trying to catch fish with, uh, here's my little primitive fishing setup with a little uh, oak gall bobber and some natural fishing line. So I've just, I've been trying to do all these projects at once and prioritize them. Um, so I've so far have not monetized or sold ads and I've toyed with that because one of the limitations is, you know, I'm on a bare bone budget on these videos. So if I started selling ads, I might have a little budget to get nicer equipment and do more experiences, but I'm, I'm toying with that payoff. I really like the fact that people can watch my videos and not have to sit through a 30 second ad or click, you know, after five seconds. So those are things I'm thinking about in the future. And right. Always looking forward to hunting season. That's uh, September is my my hot time for videos. So those are by far the most popular, and I enjoy the most. So. Do you? Um, and are you? How do you think about the past? Like, are you a guy that wants to? You know, you think, oh, 
the past i wish we every we could just go back to a tribal time and like <laughs> live off the land or are you do you feel like you're happy with what you got you know but, but this is a curiosity like how how do you think about th this topic yeah my wife always says you know you were born in the wrong century but yeah. i i love i love the life i have it's really a, a great life with my family and uh but i always have that interest too in the primitive skills so it's a it's an outlet to um you know, from this modern society, I don't, we don't watch a lot of TV and uh, don't spend a lot of time on the technology. So this is by far the most, uh, you know, online stuff I do. I don't have Facebook or anything like that. So um, yeah, I, I love the life I have here, but I also love learning about the past. And I think people, uh, no matter what they're doing, should learn more skills because I think we're losing skills as a society of how to fix cars and how to, you know, build things and how to solve problems on their own and uh, this is just my version of that what do you uh, well that's a very interesting topic you know do you uh yeah like how do you how do you observe that around you and like you know wh wh how do you think that changes the world if, if people lose skills and can't fix their car anymore yeah, they, they're pretty vulnerable if they ever do get in a survival situation uh, just because uh, they don't have the skills of being, you know, they lost touch with nature and how to care for themselves and how to solve problems is the biggest thing. I think everything is so easy. I don't have a smartphone, but everything's on your fingertips with the smartphone. Uh, you don't even have to, you know, get know how to drive directions anymore. You just turn it on and it takes you right to where you need to go. So. Uh, I think that people would really benefit from just maybe being less connected to the, the, the next greatest technology and really look at the past and how people survive because they thrived without everything we have nowadays. And uh, I don't know, I, th I think there's a lot of people that are unhappy with uh, always trying to get the next greatest thing. And it's really rewarding to slow down and just feel like you're more a part of nature. Absolutely, I agree. And I, I guess I, I feel like the the more that people have like maybe some of these kind of skills that you're talking about gives people a way of really participating with nature and, and making it less of something you just go and look at like a zoo or a park or somewhere but and, and something that you're a part of and the and i think it re reveals itself in a, in a much more enriching and kind of pleasurable way if you can yeah. kind of find <laughs> that path in um it's really fascinating well um the I, th you know, I think we, we covered a lot and, uh, you know, is there any, um, is there anything else you'd like to kind of, you know, share with people who perhaps have been watching you as you've kind of created these, these documents and, uh, around all these topics that, you know, uh, maybe you have no other way of kind of sharing about what you do, or what you care about. Uh, my biggest thing is I do this to try to get people to out there get out there doing it themselves. So my desire isn't that people just watch my videos, but I really want them to spark an interest in something that they're they do themselves. So even if they're not making videos, I love it when people send me pictures of uh, arrows they made or uh, notes about trying different food after seeing my videos. So that's why I do it. Is I I don't want it to just be something that I'm up here making videos and they watch. I want them to get just enough knowledge to go out and do it themselves so that's awesome that's, yeah well i appreciate what you do in, in your videos i i enjoy them a lot and i know a lot of other Thanks. people do too um and i really appreciate you taking the time to talk and to, to share your your ideas and, and kind of what you do and um so sean thanks a lot and uh thanks um hopefully this will be uh uh, uh, uh an interesting kind of picture into kind of what he's doing as as he continues to kind of forage and then we get to the point in uh, a little bit where we watch him on his uh foraged food diet for a bit i'm looking forward to that um okay all right well thank you very much and uh goodbye everybody yeah thanks